Someone poisoned the lemonade and stole the payroll. Hi, this is Grace. Uh, this is Vinny Trump Channel. I'm here with Art and John from Celebrating Act 2, the two old guys that uh, are good friends. And we're talking about Lock Up, uh, the television show. This is Season 2, Episode 30, The Case of Willie Betterly from 1961. Someone poisoned the lemonade and stole the payroll. That's what this show is about. It's coming up after this little introduction. Tell me what you got, you guys. I would start with McDonald Carey because he's the star of the show. He was a very, very well-known actor. He was known, had done movies for 20 years and was in a ton, played a ton of roles. He was known as the king of the B-movies, if, okay. if, if that'll put that into sure. perspective. And they arrested your nephew? And years later, after this show that he did for Ziv Television, he went on to become the king of the soap operas. He was on a soap opera for 30 years, maybe the longest running actor next to Susan Lucci of any soap opera. Uh, but he was very successful, very well-known actor. Well, to me, uh, yes, McDonald Curry uh, uh, and uh, John Doucette, uh, who always played a villain or a cop or a sheriff, but here he was playing a detective, so I agree with with, with what John said. But to me, uh, one of the stars of this production is Ziv, uh, Ziv Productions. Give me the top five. Give me the top five. Bat Masterson, Boston Blackie, The Everglades, Harbor Command, Harbor Master, Highway Patrol. I Led Three Lives. These are all TV shows. So you could go on and on with, with these. But the important thing was that he pulled all these gritty, mostly gritty productions. I, I got to jump in and say that they weren't all gritty. All the Ziv productions weren't all gritty. He did a wide variety of shows, TV series, including one of my favorites, Cisco Kid, and a show that Art, you and I reviewed, Corliss Archer. Yes. He had started in syndication in radio, went into television, and he was known as the father of syndication. He was so prolific. His, his company was bought out by United Artists. Oh, yeah. And he was building TV shows in Hollywood long before the studios recognized that television could be a, um, a, a good customer for them. Yeah. Let's jump back to lockup specifically. You know, the premise of the show was a crime and then the aftermath of the crime, the results in the legal system. Since our lead character is an attorney, actually a real life guy from Philadelphia. And these are taken from his real life cases. It was about the importance of due process and the defense attorney's role in the legal system. But the, uh, the creator of the show is a guy named James Mosier, who uh, also was heavily involved in Dragnet back in the day. So that was part of the background of the program. It's a pretty neat show. There's uh, there's 30 minute episodes, 25 really. I think there's like, it was two seasons, 39 times two. What's that? 78 episodes in total. So I have a bunch of them on the channel already. And this is the first one in color. It's our color. We've colorized it. First time in color. It looks pretty good. It looks good. We're getting better at it. Got more coming up. I think it's probably time to let's get started on the program. It's coming up in check the countdown in just a few minutes, a few seconds. So. I'm Grace. This is Vinny Trump Channel. This is Art and John from Celebrating Act Two. Uh, check out their channel, and we'll see you next time. So enjoy the program. <laughs> why? Why, it's a birthday cake. Nettie made it herself. I'd better blow the candles out. Willie! Oh, you're just in time for the party. It's Mr. Sobel's birthday. Well, blow, Horace. Pour the lemonade, Melanie. Come along, William. Put the payroll on Mr. Sobel's desk and we'll count it later. Aren't you going to join us, Miss Patton? Say, Mr. Sobel, what'd you wish when you uh, blew out the candles? Hmm? Wish? Why? Why? Oh, tell me, let me guess. I bet you wish they'd cut the red tape, give you your inheritance, and then you and I could uh, sort of, you know. A toast to Mr. Sobel. 
Happy birthday, Mr. Sobel. There's a beauty about the morning when it begins quietly, and when it doesn't... Well, young man, it's about time. Well, good morning, J.Q. Don't good morning me. I retain you to take care of my interests, and I also would like to be able to find you when I need you. I've been on another case all week. Now, if you'll just sit down. <laughs> I don't like excuses, Herbert Mayers. My nephew has been stripped of his family dignity, and I won't have it. I'm an old man. But I'm strong inside. And they don't know that. Who? The police. The district attorney. Public servants. Do you know what those balloon heads have done? They've arrested my nephew, William. Well? Why don't you say something? All right, J.Q. Most of my clients come into this office seeking advice. But not you. Uh, normally, I ignore the insults and try to remember it's all bluff, but this time it's different. I don't know why your nephew's in jail, but you're not going to be able to run your steamrollers to the police department, and you might as well know it. <laughs> you know, I wish my nephew had spunk like you. You never met him, did you? No. I wish you had. Because if you had, you'd know how preposterous this arrest is. If ever I cross swords with this fellow that calls himself Lieutenant Weston again, I'll... You'd see another dimension if you needed his help. I'd see a psychiatrist immediately. I made the error yesterday of asking his help when I found out my payroll had been stolen. Your payroll? And they arrested your nephew? Yes. They arrested my nephew. They thought it was quite plausible to arrest the young man who was going to inherit my entire estate and someday be the president of my company. So naturally, <laughs> they thought he was the one who tried to poison my entire payroll department so that he could rob me of $10,000. Poisoning the whole department? Certainly. Why, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I've been waiting for you, Herb. Yes, uh, ever since that lovable old scoundrel poked me in the chest and called me a frustrated bulldog, I knew he was going to need you to keep me from putting him in a jail cell next to that other fiend in his family. He said a lot of nice things about you too, John. Yeah, well, spare me. I don't want to get a big head. As a matter of fact, every time I think of a case, I get all choked up inside. So rather than subject you to my biased interpretation, I'll let you read Willie's confession, then you can draw your own conclusion. Confession? Yes, in which he describes his warm-hearted motivation for nearly wiping out the payroll department. He said he wanted money to give to the poor. What kind of a statement did the others give? Well, you don't give statements when you're unconscious. And all of them were poisoned except him? No, he took a little of it, enough to knock him out for a few minutes. Now, the others have been released from the hospital this morning, all except uh, one woman, uh, Miss Patton. She nearly died. What kind of poison? Chloral hydrate. It's a powerful hypnotic. Have they recovered the money? Not yet. He said he put it in a blind man's cup. Mr. Maris, it's such a simple concept. I don't know why people can't understand it. You give and get joy from knowing that the gift is needed. That's all there is to it. You're happy because someone else is happy. Food for the spirit instead of the stomach. Uh, does, does that make sense to you, Mr. Maris? I think so, Willie. Your soul was hungry, so you fed it. That's very perceptive of you, Mr. Maris. But there's another side to the coin. 
Everyone needs to give, but not everyone knows how. My uncle never gives anything without expecting something tangible in return. He thinks he's giving, but it's really barter. So you decided to force him into the noble act of giving, and you had no qualms about destroying life to do it. Oh, no. It was an incredibly inhuman act, which you couldn't possibly have committed. But I did do it. I put the poison in the lemonade in the morning. And the and rocks and the payroll on the way back from the bank. I read the confession and I don't believe a word of it. But it's true. But I do believe you resent your uncle's domination and his lack of understanding. You'd prefer to remain here in jail than to go back to the company. No. The police won't believe you, Mr. Maris. They told me that I was the only logical suspect. Would you accept it as a crutch? <laughs> it won't do you any good to appeal to my pride, Mr. Maris. I don't have any. But you have compassion. You care for humanity, don't you? Does any man have the right to take another man's life? No. But a potential killer is free to destroy life because of your confession. Is that what you want? No. No, I just want to be left alone. But you're not going to be left alone. You're going to get on your feet and you're going to fight. You're going to fight the police, <laughs> the district attorney, your uncle, and every other authoritative voice in the world. Do you hear me? <laughs> What greater treasures than the beauty of a lovely garden and your lady love beside you? Horace, do you think those nice policemen will turn up in this weather? Oh, you know policemen. They'll show. Do you know what I'm going to do first off when I get to Paris, Nettie? Horace, you know, I've been thinking. You better not tell the police about your trip. If they know that you're planning on leaving for Europe next month, they're likely to think that you stole the payroll. Oh, Nettie. Here they are now. You are from the police. Yes, Lieutenant Weston. This is Mr. Maris, the Bentley boy's attorney. Well, I'm Nettie, and this is Mr. Sobel. Sobel? This is all quite exciting, having a rendezvous in the park. Rather like one of those uh, European trench coat affairs. Horace. Oh, where are the others? Well, Melanie's out there thinking. You know, she analyzes dreams. And Miss Patton is... She's our contometer operator. She hasn't been with us except for a few months. You know, you can't get reliable people anymore. Mr. Sobel had to fix her machine five times this week. She's home recuperating. Why, well, the poor child nearly died. Well, we all nearly died, Horace. And you all had access to the lemonade. Well, yes, we all had access, but we didn't all know about it. You see, it was Mr. Sobel's birthday. Mr. Sobel, would you tell me exactly what happened to your birthday party? Well, I was about to blow out my candles when William came in with the payroll. He uh, put it on my desk. And then we uh, all drank the lemonade. You didn't check the contents of the payroll box? Whatever for. If I hadn't trusted William, I wouldn't have sent him out for the payroll now, would I? But if you didn't open the pouch, there'd be no way of knowing if the money had been removed before or after it reached your office. Yes, I see what you mean. Any one of us could have done it. If we had a reason. Sobel certainly didn't. He has a fine, substantial job and an inheritance. Nettie and I are going to be married in a few months. Oh, Nettie, Horace, you'll never guess who the little man in the trunk was. Melanie, this is Lieutenant Weston and Mr. Maris, William's attorney. How do you do? What did you say about a man in a trunk? Well, I was in a steamer trunk with a tiny little man, and there was a lock on the inside. In my dream, this is. And I just didn't have the slightest idea who he was. <laughs> you can imagine how frustrating that would be. Yes. Well, I finally figured it out, and it was you, Mr. Sobel. Me? Yes. With all that exciting talk about your taking a trip to Europe. <laughs> I just wished myself into your trunk. Well, why was the lock on the inside? Oh, come on, Herb. You know, if you're inside a trunk, you want to get out when you... Did you say Europe? Yes. Isn't it exciting? Mr. Sobel is taking a kind of sabbatical. He says he's only going to Europe for two months, but with his inheritance, I just wouldn't be a bit surprised if he didn't come back at all. Good <laughs> gracious, look at the time, Horace. We must go back to the office if we expect to get that new payroll out today. Mr. Maris, Lieutenant. Now, uh, if you need us for any further help, don't hesitate to call on us. Bye-bye now. Bye now. Quite a group. I can hardly wait to see what Miss Patton's like. Hmm. 
You see, Lieutenant, there's two sides to everything. Oh! Miss Patton, my name is Herbert Maris. Now, I wonder if I could talk oh, to you. Threshold's right across, Mr. Maris. I appreciate your hospitality, but this won't take long. I just have a few questions that I'd like. Well, maybe if you get comfy, you'll think of some more, huh? I uh, get the feeling you're expecting somebody. No, but, well, you never know when you get company. They say the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. You see what I mean about company? I saw a brush salesman down the hall. Oh, the grotesque demands that life makes. Oh, well. Hi. Oh, you're cute. Listen, do you have one of those eyelash brushes with the bristles all around? No, but I have a 38 caliber revolver, oh. a pair of handcuffs and a bat. <laughs> Uh, Lieutenant Weston Police uh -oh. Department. <laughs> well, you're cute anyway. Come on in. You'll have to live with the John. You're cute. You're an act. Yeah, that's right. I put him in jail. He gets him out. It's a regular little routine we've worked out. A lawyer. I've always wanted a lawyer. But you know, I never had any problems I couldn't work out for myself. Who are you defending? William Betterly. Oh, Willie. Another Mr. Sobel in the making. <laughs> What do you mean by that? Nothing, really. It's just that, well, you know, I feel sorry for poor old Mr. Sobel. I mean, he wanted to be a man, but, well, he's been so surrounded by zombies all of his life that, well, it's sort of become a, a way of life with him. You know, it's a wonder he stays awake the way he keeps popping pills in his mouth all the time. What pills? I think they're for his nerves. What's the name of his doctor? No, but I'm sure you can find it in the personnel records. May I use your phone? My house is yours. Thank you. Why, Mr. Maris, Lieutenant, what a coincidence. I live here. It's not just a coincidence, Mr. Sobel. We've been waiting for you. Noble, do you recognize this? Why, uh, well, it looks like a prescription. That's right. Made out to you. Filled in for a hundred capsules of chloral hydrate. Where is it? Why, uh, well, uh, oh, here they are. I've only taken a few. I was going to tell you about the prescription, but there, there's such a thing as too much honesty. <laughs> Nettie says that I'm naive, that I should look after my interests. But you, you don't think I was responsible for the poisoning? That's what we think. But the bottle's almost full. There have been other bottles, Mr. Sobel. Well, I, I didn't need the money. I, I have my inheritance. I checked it. There never was an inheritance, Mr. Sobel. There is no inheritance except in your imagination. Well, I... I Laboratory analysis of the capsules Sobel was carrying revealed the chloral hydrate had been removed and granulated sugar substituted in its place and appeared to confirm his guilt. My client, William Betterly, was freed and I had accepted a friend's offer for the use of his hunting lodge over the weekend and invited Lieutenant Weston to join me. off and have a good time after what you've done. Do you know what the laboratory came up with this morning? Granulated sugar, and it doesn't mean a thing. Anybody in the office could have substituted sugar for the chloral hydrate in those capsules. Horace keeps his pills in his coat pocket, and, and the coat hangs on the clothes tree half the day. Anyone could have lied about getting an inheritance, but it wasn't just anyone. It was Horace. But you're ignoring the real reason. The inheritance gave him prestige. It gave him something important to talk about. He's insecure. Look, nothing's going to happen this weekend. Let me think about it. When I get back... It'll be too late. That Patton woman will have gotten her hands on William and completed the corruption. Why, they'll be past the sunset with that money. Now, wait a minute. Aren't you forgetting that Miss Patton was the one at death's door? I haven't forgotten a thing about that creature. I shouldn't be surprised if she flipped her hip at the devil and got a reprieve. 
Of course, you realize the way you're emphasizing the simplicity of this crime, it could have been anybody in the office, including you. Why should I do it? I don't need or want the money, Mr. Maris. I just want to take care of Mr. Sobel, and I can't do that when he's in jail. Mr. Maris, I've been waiting for 15 long years to marry Horace. What about Melanie? Melanie, oh, it's not within her concept of right action. It's either William or the Patton woman. Well, I'll admit the money could have saved Willie from the domination of his uncle, but it's inconceivable to me that his compassion and sensitivity would permit him to toy with human life. Men have given their lives for women, and the women are not always good. My eyes were opened at the Christmas party. You might ask Miss Patton about that little incident before you reach a decision. And I shouldn't want to be in your shoes if Mr. Sobel is wronged. Well, you see, Willie's uncle was out of town. I wanted to get away from the creeps, so, so I asked Willie to show me his uncle's mahogany-paneled office. And we were just having a little innocent conversation when... When Nettie surprised you. Well, she didn't surprise me. But she scared the death out of Willie. <laughs> so, she threatened to tell his uncle, and I decided to play up to her boyfriend just to spite him. So he took me home. And that was the incident? Well, that was one incident. Then he started to scratch at my door. So one day, I asked him in for a, a slug of mineral water. And he shoved two tickets in my face. Can you imagine traveling through Europe on a bus? With Mr. Sobel? Herb, I've been waiting for you. I almost put out an APB on you. The most season's almost over. I can't tell you how happy I am to be getting away to the mountains this weekend. After all, how many people would lend you their hunting lodge at the peak of the season? Just hope I can forget about Horace Sobel. There's something wrong with the case against him. Yeah. It's too perfect. We wired Sobel to a lie detector and it went berserk. He broke down and admitted he often thought of stealing that payroll. But he just wasn't ready. Oh, I soared. I flew. It was just like that, Melanie. What about your wings? My wings? I pushed up my shoulders. And I closed my eyes. And all of a sudden, I was pushing against the air, and I opened my wings and I floated. And you didn't fall? No. Oh, Melanie, I didn't fall. Fall from where? From the sky. I floated. And when I wanted to, I went even higher. Well, Mr. Maris, do you know what that means to me? I've been trying to fly for a year now, and it wasn't until last night after I got out of jail that I was able to maintain steady flight. We have a lot of cases like that. I'm afraid the lieutenant is a bit of a skeptic. <laughs> oh, what a pity. Don't you have a dream, Lieutenant? Oh, frequently, but it's always the same dream. I'm walking down a long hall, there's rooms on either side with bars on them. Are the rooms empty? Oh, no. As a matter of fact, there's quite a demand for those rooms. That's what's called a harem dream. Only I've never heard of it with bars before. Do you suppose that's an indication of some sort of hidden hostility? Perhaps it is, Mr. Maris. Dreams steal through the crevices of the strongly fortress minds, and we don't dream trivially. Now, take Willie, for instance. For him to fly is the greatest triumph of all. It's a break from social restraint. I'm not going back to the company, Mr. Maris. Have you told your uncle? No, I'm not going to. I don't owe him anything. That's not the point, Willie. You don't win battles by running. You just postpone them. But that's not the reason I'm here. You're here about Mr. Sobel. You don't think he's guilty. I'm not clairvoyant, Mr. Maris. But it's simply the last few days I haven't been able to think of anything else. He's not guilty, you know. Tell them about the dream, Melanie. Well, I was in a trunk with a tiny little man with a lock inside. Well, I was quite cheered when I learned it was Mr. Sobel. We get along quite well. But then a strange thing occurred. The night he was put in jail, the dream repeated itself. But I was alone. He wasn't there. And I was lonely. So I opened the top. And there was Nettie with a great big cake in her hand. 
Yes, go on. But I reached out, and I pushed it straight in her face. Then I woke up. And Melanie never hurts anyone. Wow. That's very interesting. <laughs> May I have your attention? Nettie, will you please sit down? I realize I'm jumping the gun just a little bit. And I can't make it official until Mr. Sobel's trial is over. However, in the meantime, William will be the head of our department. And, of course, Nettie will continue as his assistant. Mr. Sobel will not go to trial, Mr. Betterly. That's not my affair, Nettie. I'm simply trying to run a business and it cannot be run without organization. Not your affair. After 20 years of dedicated service, you're just, you're just going to abandon him? My dear Nettie, I am not responsible for Mr. Sobel's predicament. I am simply his victim. However, I shall give him the courtesy of not making any official statement until his trial is completely over. But in the meantime, William shall be our head supervisor. Willie! Oh, wonderful. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Willie! I'd like to see you in my private office and uh, bring the account books. Good luck. <laughs> Queenie, the rain is over. Poor old Mr. Sobel. He worked so hard to get away from you. Pills, inheritances, the uh, trip to Europe. He wasn't coming back. You didn't know that, did you? I can only hope that you will be the prosecution's chief witness, Miss Patton. And we shall prove by the jury who is right. The little debt that you made in Mr. Sobel's past will hardly be noticed. Compared to the 15-year survey that you made of his loves, hates, illnesses, disappointments... And, and his dreams, Miss Patton, which were noble. There was hardly a thought that Mr. Sobel did not share with me. Which is precisely why you are the only person who could have committed the crime as efficiently and successfully as Mr. Sobel might have. A wonderful plan dropped right in your lap. Nettie! Of course. That's why I pushed the cake in her face. My subconscious knew what my heart wouldn't accept. Just one more question, Nettie. Where's the money? Oh, it's all there. I've been working it back into the company. A dollar here, a few dollars there. It can be checked. I didn't want it. I only wanted to bring Horace to his senses. But he couldn't do it with Miss Patton around, so she got an extra dose of poison. I coated her glass. But there's some things you can't kill. How long will I be in jail, Lieutenant? A good long time. Very well, I'll take my chair along. Come along. Uh, uh, Mr. Mary. Yes? Do you give legal advice? But how can I face them when they know I thought of doing such an evil thing? I'm so sorry for everything. How can I convince them? You'll never know unless you open the door, Mr. Sobel. Oh, it's Mr. Oh, it's so good.